The bravest thing of all is always hope. That quote is one of the most beautiful to me, coming from Reese Roper, the lead singer of the band Five Iron Frenzy and Brave Saint Saturn. Hope is brave. It requires much of us, and it forces vulnerability. For some, this comes easy. And for many of us, myself included, opening yourself up for disappointment, for unmet expectations, can simply be too hard. So today, we are going to talk about hope and why it is a natural and essential component of art making. My name is Zach, and if art talks like this are your cup of tea, please consider subscribing. Well, what is hope? Often, it is easier to define these topics, but hope functions as both a verb and a noun. Let's start with the noun from our trusty Merriam-Webster. A desire accompanied by expectation or belief in the fulfillment. Also, an expectation of fulfillment or success, something desired. As for hope in its verb state, we get to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen, or to be true. To want something to happen, to desire with the expectation of fulfillment, to desire. Hope is complicated, and yet, like many of these illusory words we manage daily in our beloved English, we seem to have an innate understanding of what it is and how it functions. So let's talk about hope. And to clarify at the start here, I am not going to talk about pieces of art specifically dedicated towards the concept of hope or inspiring hope. In human history, especially in difficult times, art has often been used in such a way. But I am more interested, at least for today, in how art by its very nature invokes and involves hope. So let's break this into a couple pieces. The relationship of hope with the artist, and the natural assumptions of hope. In my experience, hope is intrinsically linked to art making. It seems not only to be a crucial component in the making of things, but also something that is missed sorely in its absence. It sustains much of what we do. Let's start this discussion by hearkening back to the quote at the beginning. Hope is brave, and art requires bravery. Hope is brave because it allows for the possibility that things can go the way you desire that beneficial outcomes are, in fact, attainable. It's easy to sidestep this, to just assume things will go poorly, or even more realistically, to assume things will just simply go the way they often do. This is not unwise, but it disallows for the possibility of things going better than you expected. Whenever you set out upon a new blank page or canvas, you are hoping for something hoping to learn something, hoping to refine a skill, hoping to achieve something great. If hope is not involved, you almost set yourself up for a bad time, for a study session that simply frustrates you, for a project that misses the mark. Hope is brave, and bravery is required. This is a particularly emotional topic for me, which is odd, considering how unemotional I am with most of my life. Hope, though, is such an interesting thing, such an ethereal thing to yearn for something, to choose to believe that something is likely to happen when so much of the future is truly unknown, it is brave. And it's also very difficult. And it has been hard for me and difficult for me specifically. I usually relegate my thoughts and expectations to a fairly pessimistic domain, expecting little and being seldom disappointed. This is a safety mechanism. It offers me more opportunities to be pleasantly surprised, and more importantly for me, it gives me the illusion of control. However, it also kills my ability to have excitement about the future, about possibilities that are less than secure. It's a good strategy when it comes to avoiding disappointment, but it is a terrible strategy for finding joy in life. I'm working on it. I'm working on it hard. I have that quote here in my studio to remind me as often as I need that hope is okay, even though it is risky. You have to have some manner of hope to believe a piece can be successful in the first place. Without hope that the piece or project can work out, why even work on it? Think about this though. If you open that first blank page of your sketchbook and honestly don't believe anything good can come from it, what are you going to do? You might stick to save things and you might just close that brand new sketchbook and walk away. You have to have hope to believe that something cool can happen, even though it also allows for the possibility that something can go wrong. This is an area where sketchbooks can be your best friend, or they can be the anchor that pulls you down to the sea of doubt. In my time with sketchbooks, I have found that I usually work best if I have two active ones at the same time. 
One, I relegate to the fun experimental things, things that I don't really have any expectation for. If I have a page in that sketchbook that doesn't turn out well, that ends up with a whole bunch of ugly drawings, then so what? I don't really care. The other sketchbook is the one that I focus then on doing things that are far more artistic in nature, where I might actually show someone the drawings and the sketches therein. In that one, I tend to do a lot of preparatory work. I try to make sure that things turn out well, and I take steps to ensure that they do. This naturally means that that sketchbook doesn't have as much exploration in it. The other one, in fact, will usually have the preparatory work, the sketches, for the stuff that I do in my finishing sketchbook. So these might be called like a ugly sketchbook and a pretty sketchbook. I'm sure I could come up with better terms, but for now that'll work and the simplicity is probably a good thing. That ugly sketchbook is my anchor. It's the one that I don't have any intention with. I just sit down and I draw things and sometimes those things turn out really cool and sometimes those things are really terrible. But at the end of the day, it's just a release for me. I get the same kind of feeling when I sit down to play guitar because that's something I'm a little bit more proficient at. Uh, <laughs> so I, I can just kind of fiddle around on there and it's fun and it's, it's good for my soul. Drawing has a lot of other things linked to it. And sometimes for me, it can be a lot more stressful to work on. So I find it really beneficial that I have arenas that are set aside just for play and arenas that are set aside for beautiful things, things that I can have expectations concerning. And then the two naturally bleed into one another and I try not to be super strict about it. Now, the only problem these days is that I probably have about six or seven active sketchbooks at a time, and that makes the whole uh, delineation a little bit more difficult to track. If you find yourself without hope when it comes to a piece, a firm belief that you are only able to accomplish a certain level of art, you likely need to back away for a moment. Examine your past work and build logical assumptions about that work. Well, what if all of your past work is terrible? Then narrow your focus. Put time into a specific thing, something you care about, or the least bad thing in all of your work. Chances are, if you think all of your work is terrible, you're simply wrong, and you need some outside perspective. We have built a Discord community specifically for things like this, so if you want some support, even some mild to heavy critique, check out the Discord link below. The other option is that if you are a beginner, and that's why your work can't help you know if things are gonna be okay, and if this is the case, welcome to starting art. It takes time, and you should be patient with yourself as you move forward. Focus on things you find fun and focus on the basics. I promise the journey will be worth it. But I also have to be honest and promise that the journey will be long. If you are committing to learning how to become an artist, a drawer, a painter, a sculptor, whatever it might be, strap in and understand that you're going to be here for a long time. I was thinking yesterday about what that long time actually looks like, and I might do a video here in the next couple weeks on how long it actually takes to learn art. The secret answer to that is that it's not really something we can nail down very easily. And though a lot of people have, and you can find all kinds of videos on this platform that will tell you how to learn how to draw in 30 days, most of them are zooming in on a very particular thing. They're teaching you how to copy in that time. They're teaching you how to draw a specific thing in that time. Learning how to draw is much larger than any of those individual facets. And I don't think that anyone can tell you exactly how long it takes to learn how to draw. Stan Prokopenko, who has a channel on YouTube here called Proko, he's a great artist, and he spent a lot of time working with artists in his professional life. He sometimes talks about this as a five, seven, or 10 year artist building journey, that it takes about that long in order to become proficient as a drawer or as an artist. He's probably not that far off, but it's quite difficult to try to come up with figures, accurate figures at least for something like this, because it doesn't allow for how much time that person is going to put in. It doesn't allow for where that person is in their life if they've already become proficient at something that is parallel to art or something that is similar. If they have really good study habits, if they're a savant, if they have some talent, and what kind of support structure they have in their life. There's a lot of factors. So it's really, really difficult to come to some manner of conclusion as far as how much time it's gonna take for you to really become proficient at drawing. However, I think there are a lot of things that you can do to kind of make that journey more pleasant or even make that journey swifter. But if you are beginning, just understand that it's a worthwhile endeavor. It's just going to take a lot of time. And if you don't have hope that your piece can eventually turn out well, that it could actually turn out well, 
it's going to be really, really hard for you to move forward. So whether you're a beginner or you've been at this for a while, try to remind yourself of this as you keep moving forward. Hope can give you a more optimistic outlook on the potential of trying something new. Hope can help you take risks. I have this point on the outline apart from the other ones because I think it actually is its own thing. Hope can lead you to try new things, things that you know aren't safe, things that you have a limited or no experience with. Without hope, you can end up simply doing the same thing over and over again because the metrics are better known. You know the data, you have a high likelihood of understanding exactly what the outcome will be, and that's safe. You can predict how something is going to go if you've walked that path a hundred times before. With hope by your side, there is less to prevent you from simply trying watercolor for the first time, from finally giving digital art a try, or from getting back into oil painting. These things are risky, new things always are, but if you give in to hope, if you allow it to come by your side, hold your hand and guide you on, these scary unknowns can be seen as what they really truly are, new opportunities. Whereas our rational minds can narrow our vision for the future, hope opens it up. When you look at a new potential with hope in mind, so many threads of fate are visible. There are so many things that can happen. It's odd, especially for me. I have such a tendency to try to look at everything logically, look at what I can count on and what is most likely to happen. And yet, if I truly allow myself to fall into that hole, I would never try to write a book, create a podcast, or make a graphic novel. The statistics and odds tell me that it is folly that such a small percentage of people who attempt such things ever get anywhere. And yet, I have hope that something might land. I cannot in truth say I have hope that any of it will work, but I certainly cultivate the hope that something might work eventually. Most days, that's enough. The simple possibility that success exists and that, though unlikely, it is achievable by humans. So try some new things and open up your mind, your heart perhaps, to the possibility of things going well. Hope can unlock motivation and inspiration. Without it, the two are almost locked behind bars. This point is adjacent to the others, of course. Hope, by its nature, can motivate you, and there might be enough of a case to be made for that simple reason being enough. Maybe that is all you need. But a lack of hope, a lack of believing that you can accomplish something, will hamstring your motivation like nothing else can. If you don't think you can draw, then finding the desire to dive in is nearly impossible. If you don't think you can improve, then finding the ability to do so is going to be more elusive than the Loch Ness Monster. If you really want to grow, to focus on your art, you have to choose to hope. Choose to believe that you can in fact accomplish what you want to. In reality, there is no test, no algorithm that can prove whether or not you can succeed. And because you can never confirm that success is impossible, hoping for that success becomes an almost logical way of taking care of yourself, of pushing forward. When you choose to hope, motivation will often begin to leak through the dam and find its way into your life. When you choose to think that you can actually accomplish the thing, that your graphic novel, your work, your comic, whatever it might be, could come to fruition, then it's exciting and fun to dive into those things. If you sit around reading articles about how hard it is to publish, then when you sit down a couple hours later to try to actually write, it's going to be difficult. Somewhere in your unconscious mind, you have already convinced yourself that the work that you're engaging in is silly, it's folly, and there's no point in doing so. Now, I have to allow for the possibility that that might actually be true, but even if that's the case, you will never know. We will never know whether the drawing we're working on now will be the one that finally hits the epiphany that we need. We never know if the painting that we're working on tomorrow will be the one that finally catches someone's attention and catapults our career. We simply don't know these things. To assume that we do is ignorant and arrogant. So we have to choose to hope and know and understand that we will likely gain some further motivation from this. It's an intriguing thing. But when I'm excited about the artistic things that I'm working on, and that excitement always comes from the possibility of those things working out well, and it's probably the same for you or similar for you, I'm excited to work on them. When I'm working alongside someone else, it makes it more exciting. When I have the possibility of something working out well, then it's more motivating to get into the thing. And I think most of you will find this true as well. When you choose to hope, inspiration can often flood in as well. 
I'm not sure why this happens, but I think perhaps we keep inspiration at bay when we think we can't actually achieve something. And so it is almost like once we uncage it, it just catapults itself into our life. Inspiration, of course, is quite a bit different than motivation. It is the random ideas that come to us, the things that are exciting for us that push us into creating things. Whereas motivation, of course, is the desire, the thing that pulls us into that creation process. I think they are tethered though in some capacity. When we have motivation, often inspiration, the more ethereal counterpart to it, will find its way to us. We can be inspired, but if we don't have any motivation, it doesn't go anywhere. But the point here is that if you choose to hope, that you have a much higher chance of motivation and inspiration spontaneously occurring in your life. I've talked before on the podcast about how you can't rely on either, that you kind of have to construct methodologies to work regardless because they're fickle in their nature, but also that you should plan to utilize them when they do occur. If you've got everything else in line, if you are full of hope about your prospects moving forward and motivation or inspiration or in the wonderful situation where both hit simultaneously come to you, you'll be in a position to utilize them. And that's a wonderful thing. Of course, we won't have an endless supply of either, but we will likely have a small flood of it when we allow for hope. I'd like to take a few minutes now to talk about the natural assumptions of hope. This might sound a little weird, but when we dare to hope, there are several assumptions we have to make about the nature of the world. And I think it's worth our time to delve into some of those, to take a look at what they actually mean and what they are. So hope by its nature assumes that beauty exists. Regardless of how we might define it, when we hope for something artistically, we are generally hoping to turn out a more beautiful piece of art, or the ability to make things that are more beautiful. The beauty is a rather elusive term, but another of those ethereal things that we seem to have a natural human understanding of. Hope, therefore, assumes that beauty exists, that it is viewable, replicatable, or even achievable. This is one of the most wonderful things about hope when it comes to your art. When you are painting and you look at the last painting that you made and it really didn't turn out like you wanted it to, and you start working on the next one full of hope, what you're really hoping for is that that next piece is going to be a more accurate representation of whatever it was that you were working on. Sometimes this is literal. It's going to be a more accurate portrait, a more accurate dog, a more accurate landscape. But sometimes it's a more beautiful representation of whatever the emotion is that you're working on. A lot of my paintings are fairly impressionistic or post-impressionistic in nature. And this basically just means that I'm concentrating more on the emotion of the thing than I am the actual physical details of it. When I paint a tree, for example, I'm trying to accomplish or get across something related to what I felt when I was in that moment. Now this sounds really emotionally esoteric, and that's not really what it is. It's uh, more just the, the sense of the reality of that moment, as opposed to the exactness of the physical details. If you think about it, for example, if you see a portrait of a person that is done 100% perfectly, it might not convey much about who that person was. But if that portrait has them with a particularly unique expression that only they made, the color choices show some extra vibrancy, there are other things that are showing in that moment. Cartoons are a wonderful expression of this trait. The ability to show something that is not necessarily realistic, but is perhaps more real than the thing if it was just a photograph. It's a skill, of course, to be able to illustrate things photorealistically. But I've found in my life that a lot of photorealistic drawings and paintings are quite boring. They're devoid of much spirit other than just the concept and the details that have made their way onto that page. In fact, a lot of cartoons and a lot of impressionistic paintings carry a more human emotion than their realistic counterpoints and counterparts. This is odd, and I struggled with this when I was younger. I tried to look at things and just think of them logically when it came to art. And of course that kind of came to this point of, well, the more realistic your art is, the better it is. And that's just not true in any capacity. It's something that I've come to a conclusion with as I've moved into my adulthood, but also just as I've become a little bit less arrogant and a little bit more humble about my existence here on this funny little earth. 
The idea that you can represent the reality of a thing without using all the details is a little difficult to wrap your head around, especially if you are a particularly legalistic or logical person. But cartoons do a wonderful job of communicating the human experience, and they don't look anything like real humans most of the time. In fact, you can get a lot of representations and expressions in cartoons that are so exaggerated that they convey more happiness than a human is actually capable of feeling. They convey more fear than a human is capable of actually feeling, which, you know, is good. It's an interesting proxy for us to be able to see those things. But there is beauty in all of those representations. And when you allow yourself to continue moving forward to hope that your piece can turn out better, to hope that you can improve, you are trusting in that natural assumption of hope, the natural assumption that beauty exists in the world. And that actually moves us into the next natural assumption of hope, that it assumes that there are things beautiful enough to depict in our world, things that are important. It is springtime now, and flowers are beginning to burst from the ground. These little things of beauty have inspired artists for generations, even going so far in ancient cultures as grinding or drying them to turn them into pigment themselves. Hope assumes that there is beauty in the world, that these things are actually beautiful, that they're worth depicting, that they're worth studying. When I sat down to draw the mushrooms for a sketchbook session a few weeks back, I was not necessarily intending to just see beauty in these weird fungal bodies. But the longer that I drew them, the more that I came to realize how individually unique and special every single one of them was. You can go peek at that sketchbook session if you want, but it was just fun after a little bit of time realizing how intricately designed every single one of them is. And you find this a lot when you get out into the world. We are fortunate here. We live in Colorado. Uh, we live at the base of the mountains. And so going on adventures or exploring is just not that far out of our reality. The last couple weeks have actually afforded us with several opportunities to get up into the mountains. And every time that we do, I'm taken aback by how beautiful things are. And of course, it's like the vista, right? You see the mountains in the distance and in spring, you see the green starting to occur and you're like, ah, yes, much pretty. But there's also like the subtleties of things, the way that snow sits on a single face and not on the other because it's shaded over here. The way the pine trees change in the light, the way that old buildings look as they kind of emerge from the snow melting around them. The rock faces at different times of day, some that are very, very boring in the morning and others that are absolutely stunning because of the yellows and the oranges and pink hues that are arriving upon them. There is beauty around us, and when you give in to hope, when you allow hope to be a fundamental component and part of your art making process, you're acknowledging that there is beauty out there in the world, that there is beauty that you can dedicate yourself to, that there are things worth studying, putting time into and understanding. And of course there's fun and there's joy in all of this, but it's such a beautiful trait about being human that we have the ability to see beauty in simple things and to see beauty all around us. Hope allows us to assume that people deserve to partake in beauty. This goes both ways, that you as the artist deserve to partake in this beauty and that the viewers of your art deserve to see that beauty. We as artists transform thoughts, feelings, and the realities of our daily life into art into something that can, by its nature, convey beauty. This is a huge task, a responsibility that mythology often hands to the gods. And yet, here we are. Normal creatures tasked with bringing beauty to the masses. It's a big responsibility, and I think none of us should take it lightly. This might seem a little metaphoric, or like I'm being exaggerative, but in reality, I'm not. Art in its myriad forms gives many people the joy that they need to simply continue going on. The art of novels, of books, of movies, of video games, of seeing beautiful paintings and drawings, of watching videos, of listening to podcasts. These are all different forms of art. And this of course is not an exhaustive list because that would take a very long time and we'd probably get into some arguments along the way. Maybe a fun thing to do at another point in time. But art brings joy to people. It is an interesting thing that not everybody seems to be dedicated to, 
You could make a good argument that not everyone has that calling. That art is in a certain way a calling, a thing that we as individual humans are built for, whether by design by some deity or by our evolutionary biology. It is potentially a calling. I tend to see it this way, and that's part of the reason why I look at it like the Greeks and the Romans would have looked at something that was in the domain of the gods. That art is important. It is a fundamental component of what it is to be human. You could argue that art existed prior to civilization, that the cave paintings in Lascaux and France and things like that existed obviously before people were moving away from their nomadic traits, that people were moving from location to location, and it was still very important for them to depict things on the cave walls or in other fashions, probably many, many other fashions that we've lost to time. But certainly, as soon as humans settle down, as soon as civilization really has a central location in anywhere in the world, art emerges. And I think that it is fundamentally linked to civilization. There's something about being human that the second we have a chance as a species, we start representing things and we start making art. Artists have often been tasked with being the history takers. We're the ones that record the details, record the paintings and the illustrations. The writers do this as well, and writing is its own art form. Though not all writing is an art form, but also I wouldn't say all drawing is an art form. But let me know what you think about that one in the comments. But art seems fundamentally linked to human civilization and culture. We as artists have been tasked with providing beauty to the masses. And this is a burden. There is a, a burden placed upon us. And this is, I, I know this is a strange way to think about it, and I'm totally fine if you disagree. But I think that if you have the desire and you have the need to replicate things, to represent things, to draw, to paint, that there is something inside you that is serviced by doing those things, by giving into it. I could probably make some kind of uh, ethical or moral case for if you decline to engage in it that you are not serving out your purpose for the human race. Uh, I'm not sure if I believe that, but I, I certainly believe that if you are an artistic person, you are a creative individual who has a natural inbuilt desire to make things, that you not only will make the world a better place for yourself, but for everyone else if you choose to engage in that. And that's what I mean by our burden. It is the thing that we have been tasked by some component of the cosmos to do. And if we do it, we aid our fellow humans. And although I know I make a lot of jokes on here about humans being pretty terrible, and I stand by that because a lot of the times they are pretty terrible, they're also pretty much the only thing that makes existence worth continuing because humans are wonderful and terrible and wonderful, and terrible. And uh, yeah, I'm rambling now, but that's okay. I mean, we're almost 30 minutes into this. If you're still here, then I suppose you're okay with the rambles. But yeah, this whole point of trailing off just kind of solidifies on the fact that one of the first things that humans ever develop when we settle down is art. And I think there's a fundamental reason for that. That is the conveying of beauty. We need beauty to exist, to actually have a full and developed and worthwhile life. And this is borne out in much of our literature and our art as we look back through the eons. We listen to people like Aristotle and Plato and they talk about these things in a lot of their speakings and in their writings, since we don't actually have recordings of their speakings. But there's a lot of focus over the ages on these things. And I really think that it's, it's fundamental. Art is fundamental to being human. Beauty is needed to have a good life. And that actually takes me into the last assumption of hope. It assumes beauty is good for humanity. Lastly, I think this is a wonderful place to finish off. That beauty is good for us. It's good for humanity as a whole. It's difficult to find sources or cite materials to prove something like this, but I kind of just believe it in my bones. We were meant to experience beauty, and our lives are better for it. Well, what can we do with all this information? I was thinking about this as I was putting the script together, as I've been recording this, thinking about, well, this is all really good information about hope and how important it is for us as artists, but what do we do with this information? Can you increase your hope? I don't exactly know. What I have learned over the years and through some counseling is that it is worth it to hope.
it's worth the pain and worth the risk of pain, of having expectations that aren't met, of being disappointed. I struggle with hope, as I mentioned throughout this episode. For me, it opens up the risk of disappointment, the ability for things to go poorly, or to simply slide in an unanticipated direction. This is scary, but my life is worse if I actively choose not to hope. So even though it opens you up for the risk of disappointment, of unmet expectations when it comes to your art, you have to have some hope. The bravest thing of all is always hope. Well, as always, thank you for your time. I appreciate the comments, I appreciate you listening, and I appreciate everything that you guys bring to the surface. If you would like to join our Discord community to become a part of a small community of artists looking for feedback and just supporting one another, check out that link below. Thank you to Patron Who, What, Where, When for their support, and if you would like to support this channel as well, you can check out the Patreon in the link below. Have a good one, y'all. See you soon.